is Chris Rock pro-life? Also, the Biden administration awarded a man a Women of Courage Award yesterday. And black equestrians, according to the New York Times, are facing dire discrimination and their reason might surprise you. Also, white students at an elementary school in Ohio were being forced by other students to recite a BLM pledge. We're talking about all of this and so much more with one of my favorite guests, and that is host of the podcast Fearless, Jason Whitlock. You are going to love his insight and this conversation. It is so wide-ranging and insightful. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout for a discount. That's GoodRanchers.com, code Allie. Jason, thanks so much for joining us. I got a lot of stuff that I want to talk to you about and get your reaction to. Um, the first International Women's Day was yesterday. I'm sure you had you had a huge celebration. I'm sure you recognize that day every year. Celebrate the feminists in your life, right? I don't even get how we got to this point where we acknowledge all these different days they set up for us. You know, yeah. I'm old, I'm 55. We didn't have these days when I was growing up. And so I'm continuing to pretend like they don't exist. Mm, gotcha. Well, I don't know. You might not be surprised to know that the Biden administration did not pretend that this day doesn't exist. They had a big celebration yesterday. First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden, Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. I don't know why he had anything to do with this, but they hosted the annual International Women of Courage Awards yesterday. Let me, let me show you one of the uh, beautiful, delicate, dainty women that won one of these Courage Awards awarded by the Biden administration. In Argentina, Alba Ruada is a transgender woman who was kicked out of classrooms, barred for sitting for exams, refused job opportunities, subjected to violence, and rejected by her family. But in the face of these challenges, she worked to end violence and discrimination against the LGBTQI plus community in Argentina. All right, so a man, a man from Brazil, not even from America, but a man who has long hair, won a, uh, an award meant for courageous women. What do you think about that, Jason? It's just uh, explains, exemplifies the Biden administration and the current culture's hostility towards truth. And so any lie that they want to promote they're going to promote and demand that we see it as the truth. And I mean, clearly that's a man who's, you know, gone to a beauty salon and had some straight hair put on. And, and we're all supposed to pretend this is one of the most courageous women uh, on the planet. And, and, you know, Biden and his wife and the presidents and all Anthony Blake, and they're all playing along and we're the bad guys for not playing along and saying, not only does that man need mental health help, all those people that are supporting his mental illness need help. Uh, it's just another example. Just We're just in a post-reality, post-truth culture right now. And, you know, we're, yeah. we're in need of a savior, that's for sure. Yeah, you know, it's funny that this person is from Brazil and that the Biden administration is saying, oh, they tried to keep, you know, tra he he tried to keep trans women from violence. But actually, like, there is a big problem of violence actually being perpetrated by these men who identify as women. There was this terrible story out of Brazil in December, and this is uh, reported by Redux. Female student assaulted by trans identified male over washroom access says she was afraid of dying. And actually, this is something that I've seen reported several several times in Brazil where you've got these guys. I don't even know if they really think they're women or not. This person that I'm looking at has a full 
has a full beard, all right, and just has long hair going into these bathrooms and assaulting women. There was this other Brazilian. Um, it was just reported recently that he was investigated. He identifies as a woman, and he's being awarded for being this amazing gamer or whatever. It was actually just investigated for pedophilia. So there is a problem of this gender ideology in Brazil, but the violence that's being perpetrated is actually going in the other direction. So our government is not even just saying exchanging the truth for a lie when it comes to this, but is actually glorifying in a lot of cases like the perpetrators of this violence rather than recognizing that the victims of this violence are typically women. It's really evil. It's evil in every direction because we're normalizing people's mental illness rather than treating people's mental illness. And so it's not surprising to me that someone's untreated mental illness is going to eventually lead to some type of violent or inappropriate behavior that endangers other people and most kids, other women. And so again, when men are weak and we don't hold the line and we don't demand truth, women and children are the most vulnerable and this whole little transgender thing we're doing is uh, displacing women from awards, recognition, uh, uh, status, mm-hmm. roles in, in, in society that, that are meant for them. And we're putting men in those spots and giving them that recognition. And no one's better, not society, not right. the people with the untreated mental illness, mm-hmm. no one's safer. It's 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 just it's just sad. Yeah. You know, I wasn't going to go here. It's not in my notes or anything, but I'm just really curious your thoughts. There's a debate right now about how to effectively push back against gender ideology. And it's, I guess, happening within the right. You've got one side who was like, no, don't be too mean about it. Watch your tone. Be nicer about it. Be sweeter about it. And the other side's like, look, we got to we got to pull all we, we got to go all in on this and we can't worry about being too nice or saying the right thing we got to make sure that we are demolishing gender ideology not saying that you're trying to physically harm in any way transgender people but we've got to push back against this ideology of course you probably saw that michael knowles that he said at cpac that we need to banish transgender ideology and he's getting all this negative attention for it saying that this was extreme even from people on the right like what's your take on the most effective strategy do we need to start kind of policing our tone and make sure that we're a little bit sweeter when talking about this idea no um anger when used properly is a good thing god gave us anger for a reason uh hate is a godly characteristic characteristic if it's not directed at individual people. And so what I see from Michael Knowles, what I see from Matt Walsh, is, is hate for evil and hate for an ideology that is damaging people. And that's a good thing. And, and if we don't express that with a little for lack of a better, animus for uh, without some passion, uh, no one's going to hear us in this current climate and culture. And so I don't have a problem with uh, the way Matt Walsh talks about this issue. I certainly don't have a problem with Michael Knowles' speech at CPAC. It was taken completely out of context. The ideology of transgenderism does need to be eradicated. And people that are suffering from this gender dysphoria need help, treatment, counseling, therapy. We need to treat their mental illness. That's compassion. The people that are trying to normalize this, they're not being compassionate. They're the actual mean-spirited people. Mm -hmm. It's no different than anybody that would, would, would look at me and say, Jason, you don't need to lose weight. You're perfectly fine. It should be normalized, blah, blah, blah. That's not a person that loves me, that wants me to live a long, prosperous life. That's someone that doesn't like me. And so if someone who, you know, if someone wants to get in my face about being overweight and Jason, you should never eat McDonald's again, (laughs) I, I actually hear that as like, oh man, this person actually cares about me. I'm not offended by that. So 
no, I, I don't think we're going to, in this instance, kill him with kindness. We got to kill him with directness. And, and what I hear from Matt Walsh and Michael Knowles is a very direct way of talking that makes it so that even a baby can understand. And, and we got to remember, you know, Jesus overturned some tables. And, and you know, when, when things get this kind of chaotic, uh, we got to let it rip, for lack mm-hmm. of a better explanation. Right. And kind is not the same thing as nice. You can be kind to someone by telling them the truth very directly. You can say to someone, look, I believe that you're made in the image of God, but God made you male. And to pretend that you're female is a farce. Now, that's not nice. That's not nice. The nice thing to do would say, oh, my goodness, you're so your wig is so beautiful. That makeup looks beautiful on you. But that's not kind. That's not kind to the individual. It's not kind to society. And for anyone who would push back on anything that Jason just said about, hey, I think we actually do see that biblically and exemplified by God, that we are told that he's filled with loving kindness. And yet we read in Psalm 5, 5, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes about God. You hate all evil doers, not just evil, but it says that God hates all evil doers. And of course, we understand that you know, we as Christians, we still sin and all that. And the only reason that we have God's unconditional love is through Christ. So that doesn't make us better than people, but God does hate evil doers. And then we read in Psalm 139, 21, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? So yes, there is such thing as godly hate. We do want what's best for those people. We want them to repent. That's the best thing that we could want for someone. But That doesn't mean that we sit back and we just say, yeah, that's fine to pretend that you're the opposite gender. I think some people, they just have a really perverted idea of what love and hate actually looks like. Allie, um, because I'm talking to you and because I'm in the habit now, I got my living commentary Bible open (laughs) and (laughs) and uh, TJ Moe gave me Andrew Womack's living commentary Mm. Bible. And I'm just I'm looking at passages that he notes that he puts in his limit comment that we are commanded to hate psalms 97 and 10 romans 12 and 9 it 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 we are to hate evil and i'm just sorry when you look at a person who has clear gender dysphoria and 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 is confused about how they were made by god and you don't talk to them in a compassionate way of like hey i understand you're confused but you are a man, and here's how we can help you get through this. Again, anybody that's arguing the opposite and is like, no, we gotta normalize this and let's cut your breast off, let's give you puberty blockers, mm. that's evil, particularly mm-hmm. when you're doing it to children. And I'm, I'm not going to apologize for hating that. Okay, y'all, I'm so excited, so excited to tell y'all about my first sponsor today because it's a new sponsor and I just know, I just know you guys are gonna love it so much. My new sponsor is Seven Weeks Coffee. So this is a coffee company that is promoting godly values. It's providing amazing, excellent coffee and it is seeking to protect first and foremost every beating heart. So this is how they got the name of this coffee company, which I just love so much. At seven weeks, at seven weeks, the baby is a size, the size of a coffee bean. It's also the same time a mother typically has her first ultrasound or right before they get that first ultrasound and you can detect the beating heart at seven weeks weeks. And so this is an amazing coffee company. They really care about where they're getting their coffee from. They care about its sourcing and the quality of coffee. And it's really, really good, by the way. But they also really care about making sure that these babies are protected, which is why they donate 10% of every single sale uh, sale to pregnancy centers across America. So this is a significant portion of their profits. They're giving 10% to pregnancy centers across America, which as you know, go back and listen to last Thursday's episode. If you don't, the pregnancy centers are the only institutions that are actually providing a real choice to women, providing them with all kinds of resources. So you can get great coffee, 
You can support a pro-life Christian company and you can support pregnancy centers by buying your coffee from Seven Weeks. Go to sevenweekscoffee.com. Let your coffee serve a greater purpose. Use promo code Allie at checkout to get a discount. That's 10% off your order. Go to sevenweekscoffee.com. Use promo code Allie for 10% off. Sevenweekscoffee.com, code Allie. Here's another story that I wanted to talk to you about, and that is um, this black equestrian story. I think I saw you talk about it on um, on Twitter, Twitter. Uh, that the New York Times reported the story on March 3rd. Black equestrians want to be safe, but they can't find helmets, Jason. There are no Jason or there are no helmets available for black equestrians. And uh, this black equestrian, Chanel Robbins, that they interviewed uh, said that, you know, she cannot find a helmet to fit over her dreadlocks. So like, tell me, is this something that you have encountered as you have tried to also pursue your dreams of being an equestrian? <laughs> yeah, this was a big problem. You know, this was on the front page of the New York Times, as if, you know, all the issues we have going on in America, this is on the front page. This is front and center, a concern for black Americans. And so how the, the helmet crisis <clears throat> for the ultra privileged who can even afford to become equestrians is on the front page of the New York Times as an issue facing black America. I would love to compare that crisis versus the family crisis, the, the, the lack, our marriage rate, our divorce rate, our child illegitimacy rate. Mm -hmm. What really has impact on black people in a culture that, that isn't having the kind of success? Is it the lack of horse riding helmets, and, and I'm just sorry, as a former athlete, there's a lot of sacrifices you have to make for your career in athletics. If this woman is unwilling to cut her dreadlocks off in order to become an equestrian, perhaps she's really not that serious about it. Because when I think about all the sacrifices I made to be a college football player, the everybody else is out late drinking, doing whatever, socializing, and I'm going to bed early or I'm making this sacrifice or I'm getting up at five in the morning to go work out. There are sacrifices you have to make. And so if you want to be an equestrian, cut your hair. That, that's not a huge sacrifice. But, you know, part of this thing, the left and, and many black women believe like hair is the most important thing that we have to offer the world. And oh my God, no one better talk about our hair, no one better touch our hair, no one better say anything about our hair. And so I guess that's how the New York Times came up with this is a major crisis facing black America, the lack of helmets for women with dreadlocks. Yeah, it's not like you have to wear your hair like that. That is a hairstyle that you are choosing to have that white people also have dreadlocks by the way that wouldn't be able to fit in this helmet if i wanted to i like to wear my hair in a bun on top of my head sometimes so if i tried to do that and to be an equestrian and put and put my helmet on top of my head and it didn't fit i guess i could say that they're discriminating against suburban moms who like to you know i don't know cook dinner with their hair on top of their heads that's some kind of anti-white anti-woman discrimination campaign but this is what uh this is what the equestrian said in it they said these sports were only developed for white people and they continue to keep white people protected and I think the irony is, is that like a helmet that is this big around that only touches your hair probably wouldn't protect you if you fell on the ground, right? Like, why can't we think about that kind of thing? I, I they're basically arguing that, you know, God invented horses and it was only for white people. He, <laughs> he built horses in a way that's more convenient for white people. And that's just a joke. And I... I just don't understand. How is this on the front page of the New York front Times? Page. Front I, page. This is like, of any newspaper, this isn't a serious story. And, and I know the New York Times 
isn't a serious journalism organization, but they used to try to pretend. And and to be quite honest, they used to be better than this. I, I was I was profiled twice in the New York Times during my newspaper career. And I got to be honest, and, and the last one I think was in 2009 or 10, 2010, and the New York Times was very fair to me. Both times they profiled me. I think 2010 and maybe in 2007, uh, both times very fair. And then all of a sudden it just changed on a dime where it, it is literally the worst publication I think I've ever read. And, and I still, every day I wake up and say, I need to cancel my New York Times subscription. And, <laughs> and maybe this equestrian story is the final straw and I'll finally do it. But yeah, I, I almost read it. I, I read it as like a hate follow that, you know, <laughs> yeah. they're going to print something stupid that will give me good content. So I got to keep the subscription up. Yeah, I kind of see it like that, too, because I subscribe and I guess it's for that reason. When people talk about, oh, my gosh, did you see this crazy bias story in the New York Times? I want to be able to read it, which I understand only helps them. But I want to be able to pull from the source. And so I guess that's why I keep my subscription, too. I just can't believe, like you said, that this made front page news. I mean, how, as you said, like comparing it to the other issues that are facing different communities, I mean, can you really consider yourself marginalized or oppressed if the problem that you face <laughs> that makes the front cover of the New York Times, not murder, not the disproportionate abortion rate, not the disproportionate poverty rate. But if what makes the front page is that you can't, which is a, such like a champagne problem anyway, like being an equestrian and having those problems. But like, how oppressed really are you if that is the reportable story in your life that you don't have a helmet that fits dreads? Like, when are we going to just give up this charade about the systemic oppression and marginalization of people whose real problems aren't really even reported on by outlets like the New York Times. The biggest charade going on is that the New York Times and liberal elites are pretending that they're fighting a fight for working class people and for working class or poor black people. Mm. That's the charade. They're not doing that. They have no interest in that. What, what, and I used to, I came up with this probably 10 years ago or 15 years ago. It's like liberals love to criticize Ronald Reagan for trickle down economics. And I'm like, liberals believe in trickle down social justice. Mm -hmm. The better you treat mm. liberal elites, that justice is going to trickle down to poor people. Mm -hmm. And so you see a lot of black, Ivy League educated, wealthy uh, uh, pundits and uh, journalists arguing for things that will benefit them while pretending as if, now once I receive these benefits, it's going to rain down on you guys in the hood. But I got to receive the benefits first. And so they hated Reagan for trickle-down economics, yeah. but they love trickle-down social justice. Oh, that's a really good point. I haven't thought about that. And But, it, like, you know, it doesn't trickle down. I think trickle-down economics is largely legitimate. But the social justice stuff, when the corporations pretend to be, you know, care about the marginalized and things like that, and BLM even pretends to care about the marginalized. It doesn't actually translate at all into the communities that really need help. If anything, it does the opposite. It destroys them. The ideas, the policies that they push actually adversely affect the communities that they say that they're pushing for and actually foments more hate and more division. And it really just makes the people pushing it Rich. So you're exactly right. That's the exact thing that they criticize trickle down economics for. It is actually true about trickle down social justice. Wow. That's a really good point. It's it's what I call pee down social justice. They <laughs> pee on you and tell you it's raining. And and it's funny. I, I don't know if you saw. Oh, I'm sure you didn't. But Chris Rock did a Netflix special live on Saturday. And it was it was great. And it was very profane. It'll be tough for Christians to watch, but much of what he was talking about had a biblical point of view 
and the right point of view, in my opinion. And one of the things he talked about was Lululemon, and they have signs outside their store talking about we're not racist and blah, blah, blah. And he's just like, hey, man, I don't care if you are or aren't racist. Just sell them yoga pants at a reasonable price. <laughs> you know, I'd rather have $20 yoga pants that are racist than $100 <laughs> yoga pants that aren't racist. I think I, sp and he was speaking to mostly a black audience in Baltimore and everybody's wildly appa applauding. These companies and everybody with their little charade of pretending like they care when they really just want access to more and more money and to do business with more and more elites. They, they, they don't care about the working class. Right. You know them. You love them. That is Carly G in Los Angeles. I love talking about them on my show and would even if they weren't a sponsor because I just believe in their clothes and their mission so much. It's a capsule clothing company really just made to make women feel good in their clothes. And I really do. This is a rare day, actually, that I'm not wearing Carly G in Los Angeles. A very rare day. Usually I am always wearing at least one piece of clothing from Carly G because I just love their stuff. I love their jeans. I love their pants. I love their jean jackets. I love their tops. They're really simple, like really basic stuff. Very versatile. You can wear it all year. You can wear it in any season of life. Lots of stuff they have. I can wear pregnant, postpartum, not pregnant or postpartum. And so I just love it. Another company that believes in our values, pro-life Christians. Carly Jean is just an amazing person. Um, and so you should definitely skip those women's clothing companies that hate you and your values and instead get your clothes from Carly Jean Los Angeles. Go to CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Use promo code Allie B for 20% off. That's a great deal. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Allie B for 20% off. CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com. Code Allie B. And speaking of that Chris Rock special, I'm glad that you brought that up. So he said a lot of things that conservatives are talking about. It's so interesting how comedy is kind of entering this space. Some of the guys like Dave Chappelle, Joe Rogan, and Chris Rock, who have been around for so long, are kind of, you know, they're kind of leading the way and obviously not being conservative, but just saying things that are true, which apparently is a conservative characteristic. But he said also, you know, he talked about the Will Smith thing, and I want to hear your thoughts on that. But a lot of something that a lot of conservatives are talking about is that he said um, he, he said there's part of me that's pro-life before using humor to remind his audience that abortion is killing a baby. She said, he said, I ha I believe women have the right to kill babies, Rock, Rock said. That's right. I'm on your side. I believe you have the right to kill as many babies as you want. Kill them all. I don't give an expletive, but let's not get it twisted. It is killing a baby. Whenever I pay for an abortion, I request a dead baby. Sometimes I call up a doctor like a hitman and I'm like, is it done? So, and then, he, well, he goes on to say, people argue about trimesters. I think women should have a right to kill a baby until they're four years old. F trimester, semester. I think you should be able to kill a baby until you get that first report card. He ain't never getting a scholarship, so we're going to the clinic. So, obviously, that's atrocious, and we don't agree with the choice, but he's making a point here. He's making a point that, like, let's get rid of all these euphemisms. Let's stop calling it reproductive rights. Let's stop lying to ourselves about what an abortion is, that it's just taking out pregnancy tissue, all these things that the pro-choice side says. And he just says, look, let's just say what it is. You are absolutely killing a baby. Just say that you're for that. So I appreciate the honesty, at least. Oh, I, I will go a step further. I think it's more than just the honesty. I, I think he's staked out a pro-life position. He, he just did it very cleverly mm. in a way that wouldn't get him canceled, mm. in a way that caught pro-abortion people, supporters, by total surprise. Because he starts out saying, I think a woman has to have control, final say over her body, and there's wild applause. And then he goes into, but you are killing a baby. Yeah. And he basically makes it crystal clear. This is murder. And if you go back and look at Chris Rock's history, the pro-abortion crowds had a problem with him since at least 2005. Mm. I believe it was Slate magazine wrote a hit piece on him in 2005 because he was mocking the pro-abortion crowd in his routine and talking about, yeah, I go to abortion rallies because the women are all easy and slutty. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and, and Slate did a story 
that headline him said uh, Chris Rock is the William Effing Buckley of stand-up comedy. And so th there's a long history. I think in 2019, he got in trouble with the pro-abortion crowd. Again, there's a long history of Chris Rock mocking these people and throwing it in their face like, nah, you guys are murderers. Deal with that. And just acknowledge mm. that. I, I thought it was brilliant what he did in his comedy routine. The, uh, yeah, I like comedy. I grew up on Richard Pryor and, and Eddie Murphy and all that. And so it, it's not hard for me to watch. Now, again, the profanity, the use of the N-word, and so, it, it, it's, yeah. it is hard. But I feel like in order to monitor the culture and to figure out what's going on in the culture and – it's kind of like a service to the audience. I have to watch this stuff yeah. and come back, tell people like, hey, here's what's going on. This is interesting. Yeah. And and so I, I really say to all Christians and believers, you should watch this and, and, and stomach some of the profanity yeah. to see that there are guys out here like Chris Rock. Most of his jokes on Saturday, maybe all of them, were consistent with a biblical worldview. Ali, he told jokes about how you know you're in a good neighborhood or not. And you can judge it by who's at home hmm. out in the neighborhood at 12 o'clock on a weekday. Mm. And he says, if you go to a neighborhood and there are women in sweatsuits, walking babies, riding bikes, and just leaving the gym, hey, you know you're in a good neighborhood. If you go to a neighborhood and there are men in sweatsuits out in the front yard lifting weights or riding bikes, you know you're in a bad neighborhood mm -hmm. because men <laughs> need to be working. Wow. That's it's, it, it's there were so many things. He talked at the end about uh, why he didn't fight uh, Will Smith on stage at the Oscars. Oh, and yeah. It's a whole point. This was the ending. It was like, I yeah, got parents. I was that. raised. Yeah. I, he goes, I got parents. I was raised. Oh, yeah. And so it was much of what I thought what he did, that no, it'll go over most people's heads. He talked about his oldest daughter and how stupid people say, you know, kids are born into the world pure and the culture just turns them bad. Blah, blah. He goes, you know who says that? People without kids. Yeah. He goes, because my oldest daughter, she came out and, and her, she's three, four, five. She's biting everybody. She's biting <laughs> her grandmama. She's biting her blah, blah, blah. She goes, you think me and my wife taught her that? Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> and so it, it's all from like he knows we're bo we're born into this world needing a savior. Yeah, that we're all fallen, and and so I, I'm just if you can stomach the profanity, yeah, the messages. None of the jokes in there violated my core values and yeah. principles, and I was just like happy because if you turn on late night TV, every joke pretty much violates yeah. my core values and principles. And, you know, I can appreciate that as and like, you know, Dave Chappelle, I would say he does have some jokes and I'm like, oh, I don't think I agree with that. But like I can take the truth out of what he's saying and appreciate it. Same with Joe Rogan. Same with Ricky Gervais. Like Ricky Gervais is an atheist and he says a lot of things and jokes about a lot of things that I'll be honest. I'm like, you know what? That's offensive to me. But rather than doing what the left does and say, oh, my gosh, he shouldn't be able to talk or he shouldn't be able to tell a joke. I watch it or I don't. And I say, OK, that was funny. That was not funny to me or that was true that was not true I feel like we've lost the ability to do that um, but I was looking up when you were talking about the Chris Rock thing so I couldn't find going all the way back to 2005 but even just last year Chris Rock said um, uh, he he said in a in a special or at a show he said um, made a joke a safe abortion abortion is an abortion where only one person dies I guess so he is making the point that pro-lifers do. There's no such thing as a safe abortion because one person is always being intentionally killed. Like what other healthcare procedure are you purposely killing the person that you are operating on or that you're working with? And so you're right. Like that's really interesting. I never knew that. He makes these points and says, yeah, I'm for abortion, but let's like just be honest about what abortion is. And I'm curious if he actually is. As you said, like, is he really pro-choice, really pro-abortion? I'm not sure, but I, I agree with you. It's really, really clever. John Swansburg wrote the Slate article, I believe, in 2005. If you punch Chris Rock, the William F. William Effing Buckley of stand-up in, that'll come up over Google. 
uh, or some reference. There. Maybe I saw the, the Federalist may have written or someone at the National Review, but I read the article mm-hmm. my, myself. He's got a long history of being basically who he was raised to be. Chris Rock comes from a great two-parent nuclear family. He had six brothers and sisters, and they are the American dream. He In, in his stand-up routine, he talked about his mother and how when she was growing up uh, in a part of the South, the, the blacks had to go to a veterinarian oftentimes to get their teeth pulled because dentists wouldn't see them. Mm. Uh, white dentists wouldn't see them. And then he talks about, like, my mother now twice a year flies to Europe to visit my daughter who's in culinary school, I believe, in Paris. And and, and he's like, I got nothing to complain about. Yeah, Life is... You know, I came from nothing to my daughter being over in Paris in culinary school. It's Chris Rock. He's around my age. He's from my generation. Uh, my parents were divorced, but we had similar upbringings. And and it's just great to see. I mean, look, look what's going on in comedy. Woody Harrelson went on Saturday Night Live and cracked jokes about Big Pharma. Yeah. And and he was the medical trials right. they've been forcing on us. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I do think I'm feeling a bit more hopeful that the, the backlash to this very toxic satanic culture, even the Hollywood types with a lot of money, they've had enough of it. And particularly yeah. if they have any memory about where they came from and what path was allowed for them to be successful. I mean, could, could you, if Chris Rock had to deal with cancel culture in his 20s and 30s, he wouldn't have the life that mm. he has now. So and, true. And so the comedian should be on the front lines. Look, it's been going, Bill Maher's clearly been red-pilled. Uh, you know, I really think the other side has, has gone just way too far and people are starting to wake up. Yeah, they need people like you and me to bring them all the way over here and see their need for, you know, that God created the heavens and the earth and all that. But we will link arms with people who don't agree with us on everything, who at least see some of the absurdities. And just by the way, we don't have to talk about this anymore, but I did find based on some of the keywords that you said, that 2005 Slate article where they said that he's the William effing Buckley of... of um, of stand comedy up. of stand up and you know it's funny because they're talking about how on what used to be Hannity and Combs on Fox News how they had a conservative actually drudge on say complain about how awful Chris Rock is because of his abortion joke his abortion said or his abortion joke said it's beautiful that abortion is legal because you know that the women there are sexually active and so you can pick them up I don't think that they on Fox News realized though what you just said that he was doing something there. Like he was actually making a point about abortion and the people who support abortion. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, he's basically saying, I have no respect for these women. I can use them. People can use them. They can be, they're, they're trash. They're beneath me and they're basically concubines. He, he's calling them out in the biggest way possible. It's very clever. Yeah, which is sad. Women, I want you to know out there, even if you consider yourself pro-choice, you are not trash. You're better than that. But there's a reason why trashy men are pro-abortion, because they can use and abuse you without the long-term consequences. Actually, I saw, and I don't think we have it, but there was this video that went viral on Twitter. I don't know if you saw it. And it was the guy. He happened to be a black guy. Seven and, kids. Yes, and he was talking. He was like, look, you know what? Like, if you... If I get you pregnant, you need to go get an abortion. I know we made the mistake of, you know, laying down together, having sex together, but I'm not ready to be a dad. Don't come asking me for child support. And I think he said that he is like, you know, the he has impregnated someone seven times and encouraged them to get an abortion seven times and you know i see all these like think pieces about all the systemic reasons why there's a disproportionate abortion rate among the black community but i think it's probably the reason why a lot of people have unprotected sex that ends in abortion because they feel like it because they want to it doesn't really go beyond that and they're just people who do that who impregnate women and women who are a part of that too without any thought they're just being 
irresponsible. I don't think it's really that complicated. Ali, I'm going to add this element because we talked about this on my show. I certainly recorded a video about it. That's about equality and men who buy into equality. And I don't buy into equality. I believe as a man, I'm more responsible than the woman when we Mm. decide to get intimate. Mm -hmm. And so that guy believes in equality. He doesn't feel he has an extra burden or responsibility. He he doesn't know anything about what God commands of men for leadership and to take responsibility. When things went haywire in the garden, God came and said, Adam, where are you? And he did that for a reason. Mm. And so if that man really understood his role, he, he would know, no, I'm not putting this on a woman. I'm going to take care of myself and take care of her. If I'm going to have promiscuous and immoral sex, I'm going to do it responsibly with a condom. I'm not going to bring a child into my irresponsibility and then have that child murdered or have that child raised without my involvement. That man was talking about he had seven kids with seven different women and that he had impregnated other women who he had talked into abortions or they were willing to have abortions because I told him I wasn't raising no baby. And what I heard primarily was just an irresponsible man who's bought into equality and he thinks that every woman he lays down with is his equal and so anything that results from this is all on her. I bear no responsibility. That man's a coward and he's an uneducated coward. And, and people hear me and I've been critical of single mothers and people get upset with me like I'm blaming it all on the mothers. No, men, irresponsible men, men who have bought into this uh, matriarchal culture, men who think women are the true leaders. And so they're perfectly fine dumping all the responsibility on a woman. You better be on the pill you better make sure you don't get pregnant. And if you do get pregnant, it's on you to provide for that child or it's on you to murder that child. That's a man dumping all the responsibility on a woman because he's bought in to the mentality of the feminist, of this whole super equality, and and that women really are the the natural true leaders. He's bought into all that. It's a coward that, that, that he has mentally transitioned. He's a mental transgender. Uh, he, he just, you know, has decided to keep his stick and balls. <laughs> oh, man, that's one way to put it. And I'll just speak to the women. Actually, I saw something that Chris Rock said. He said, he said, women, stop letting broke men get you pregnant, which I think is a good piece of advice. But, you know, obviously we would go a step further and I would say women, stop sleeping with people that are not your husband, period. If he is not willing to sacrifice the freedom of singleness or even dating for you, then he is not someone that you should be giving your body to. Because whether you like it or not, consent to sex is consent to pregnancy. People who say those are two different things, that's like saying consent to eating isn't consent to digestion it's it goes together and even if you use protection there's always a risk of it so if you are not ready to have a baby do not have sex and you shouldn't be having it's not it's not as healthy for anyone to have a baby outside of marriage so just do the smart thing i know i'm not saying that that's easy um for everyone but gosh it there's an order to Uh life there's an order to life go ahead I, I want to add one more thing, and, and I'm sorry, this, what I'm about to add is probably very secular, but, but it just comes down to responsibility. And, and so if you're a woman and, and you want a relationship with a man or, or friendship, whatever, if he's not willing to make the smallest, the tiniest of sacrifices for your benefit, Mm-hmm. And so, this, again, this is very secular. <laughs> but if that man is not willing to deny himself a half percent left, less pleasure by putting a condom on, just a, a half percent less <laughs> pleasure to protect you and him, 
That's not a man mm. you want to marry. 100%. He's not willing to make the tiniest of sacrifices. So true. Because whether or not he has a condom on will not impact you as a woman. Your pleasure will be the same. So he's not willing to sacrifice a tiny fraction of pleasure for your benefit, for his benefit, and for a potential child's benefit. That's not someone you want to marry. Yeah. That's someone you want to avoid. He, yeah. That man will not, if he won't make that tiny sacrifice, you think he's going to get up and go to work on days he's not feeling well to take care of you and your, your baby and, and your family and your household? You think he's going to sacrifice? You think he's going to be monogamous to you? The sacrifice that goes along with men as it relates to monogamy? He's not, he, he won't put a condom on. Yeah. What's going to stop him from going to strip clubs? And, and trying to hook up with whoever he can as long as you don't find out. He's not willing to make any sacrifice. He's not worthy of you. Mm, yeah. And I would say outside of the grace of God, that is true. Because we know stories, of course, of like, okay, that happens. And the guy realizes his mistake or he realizes what he did. He mans up. They get married. He starts to work. Of course, that happens. I would say that's the exception. But that happens. But not outside of the grace of God. Like it is the grace and the strength of God that might bring that person to repentance and, you know, makes or some or another authority. Maybe that guy who made the mistake has a dad that tells him, hey, buddy, like you did this. You need to now own up to it and you are going to take care of them. But like, as you're saying, that is the exception to the rule. So women be more discerning, be more discerning. You're right. They don't deserve you. All right, last sponsor for the day, and that is Naturally It's Clean. This is the cleaning company that you guys are asking me about all the time. And the reason that you're asking me about it is because a lot of these cleaning companies, they not only provide products that say that they're natural, but really when you look at the ingredients, they're not. They're filled with all kinds of nasty chemicals and fragrances, but also some of the more natural brands of cleaning products, they're basically communists. Like they've come out being anti-police and things like that. You don't have to worry about any of those things with Naturally It's Clean. Number one, it's a great and effective and very natural formula. They use plant enzymes that are very powerful. We're talking hospital grade cleaning stuff, but it doesn't reek of nasty chemicals. You don't have to worry about those fake fragrances or anything like that. Extremely effective, much safer than most of the things on the market. That's why I trust it for my family. I especially love the carpet cleaner. You guys know if you have kids, you're always trying to clean your carpet and your furniture and things like that. Juice spills yesterday for us. It was paint on one of our rugs. I just pull out my Naturally It's Clean carpet cleaner. I spray it, let it sit, and then I rub it out and it's good to go. Oh, and I just love them for that. Bob Villa says that Naturally It's Clean is the most eco-friendly carpet stain remover on the market today. Go to naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie. You'll get an additional 15% off for a limited time. Go to naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie for 15% off. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Allie. All right, gosh, there's a couple other stories, but... I think we only have time to get to one. Um, okay, this, I don't know if you've seen this. It's a story out of Ohio. And we were talking earlier about how BLM and these organizations, these corporations that push this stuff, they're actually perpetuating a lot of harm and fomenting a lot of hate. They're not talking about the things that we're talking about, the importance of fatherhood, the importance of responsibility, the importance of working hard. Instead, they're pushing on young black kids that you need to hate white people and pushing on white kids that you need to hate yourself. And this manifested itself at a school in Ohio, um, Springfield, Ohio. Last month, police were called to Kenwood Elementary School after the school's principal informed police that a group of black students um, that a group of black students were gathering several white students on a spot of the playground and forcing them to state Black Lives Matter against their will. Students that attempted to avoid the situation were chased down, escorted, dragged, and carried to that spot of the playground um, and then forced to say Black Lives Matter. One student was punched in the head by one of the suspects. Um, two parents say that their 12-year-old son was one of the students gathered 
on the playground uh, to make the declaration. And so, I, I mean, maybe this is just a one-off. Maybe this is just a rare thing. We know that kids bully, okay? Kids bully and they say stupid things. And so I don't want to hold them to a higher standard than we should. But I do, do just have to wonder, is all the Black Lives Matter curriculum and stuff that we're pushing on kids, is it actually helping bring us together or are we now living MLK's nightmare? We're living MLK's nightmare. Uh, we're living uh, a racial nightmare. Uh, I get we're living in the world that uh, Joe Biden, you know, predicted, or, or what we're we're living in a racial jungle, where we've pitted kids against each other, uh, rather than kids seeing the humanity and the common ground that they have with each other. Uh, rather than kids seeing each other as image bearers of God, we, we've turned them into identity obsessed folks uh, along racial lines, and and the BLM movement has has made black kids think they're entitled, they're owed something uh, by their white peers, and that's a recipe for death because uh, maybe you'll get some kids to bow on a knee and, and drop down and say Black Lives Matter, but your sense of entitlement is not going to stop there. That's not going to satisfy your sense of entitlement. And so you'll be waiting around a long, long time uh, for some other kids or another group of people to do something for you that God and the world require that you do for yourself. Mm. And so I, I did see this story. Uh, I saw the video. It, it's disturbing. And it's 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 again, I, kids do bully and do all mm -hmm. kinds of uh, silly things. But but they, we have certainly taught them this as adults that, hey, you black students, you black kids, you're old something. Uh, and if white people won't give it to you, they're racist and they are worthy of derision and bullying. And and, I, you know, if, if the, the message that's being sent out is so antithetical to how I grew up and what was going on in my generation. But, but the message, if I'm a white parent sitting out there, it's just like, I don't know if I want the hassle. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, let me move away because again, I don't, I could be well intentioned and say the wrong thing. And the next thing you know, I'm the worst person in the plant on the planet. Again, Kids are fascinated by each other. And I, I, I've talked about this before. People are fascinated by each other. And, and, and so kids want, oh, you got different hair than me. Let me touch it. What does it feel like? Mm -hmm. We've turned this into the most racist thing in the world. That, that oh, my God, how could you touch someone's hair? And, and how could you want to feel what that feels like? And, and we got to all pretend like all of our hairs feel the same. It's just not true. We're stopping kids from doing what comes natural to them. Kids generally just want to play with each other and have a good time, but we've programmed them to hate each other and to hate the differences, uh, the, the surface level differences they see in each other. It, it, it's that, That's what yeah. has me so passionate and upset. It's just not my childhood experience. And, and we're giving these kids a completely different childhood experience that uh, is not fun, it's not fair, it's not mm. healthy, it, it's, it's driving us apart, mm -hmm. and, and it's just sad. Yeah, I, I went to Africa when I was in high school, and we went to an orphanage there. And what did all the little kids want to do when they saw us girls? They wanted to play with our hair. They wanted to touch our hair. They hadn't seen blonde hair before. They hadn't felt the texture of our hair. And I gotta say, Jason, I'm just still, I'm just still so offended to this day. I'm sure those little <laughs> orphans in Africa. Um, you know, they were discriminating against me. I should probably get a story on the cover of the New York Times for it. Um, well, all, all these problems, all these problems that we have, we talked about a lot of them today. You're actually doing something. You're doing something about it. And one of the things that you're doing is that you're gathering men together. Because as you talk about so much, so many of the problems that we have actually comes down to 
the responsibility of dads and the responsibility of fathers is, you know, as capable as women are, as important as women are. We just we don't have the same capabilities. We don't have the same responsibilities as men do. And that is why you're bringing men together in an event on April 15th, Fearless Army Roll Call. So tell us what this is, why men should be signing up for this and how they can register. When when I was younger and uh, first getting into sports writing, Bill McCartney, the head football coach at the University of Colorado, had something called Promise Keepers. And mm-hmm. men would come together to celebrate uh, their shared love for Jesus Christ and remind each other of their roles and responsibilities in this world. And and Bill McCartney is you know no longer the head coach of Colorado and and Promise Keepers has lost it had a lot of traction a lot of success in the 90s and early 2000s and and so I want to bring that back but I, I want to bring it back with a bit of a musical aspect to it because I'm here in Music City in Nashville and I believe that music has uh, a tremendous power to bring people together Music has been rigged in this society to divide people at the moment, but I think gospel music and just music in general, if sung properly and used properly, can bring us together. And so we're going to bring men here to Nashville. We're myself, uh, Pastor Anthony Walker that appears on the show, TJ Moe, Pastor Bobby Harrington, uh, and, and Delano Squires. We're going to give a series of lectures and talks about the responsibility of men and try to inspire uh, men to go back to their communities, to go back to their families and live up uh, to this biblical role that was spelled out in the Bible. Part of our slogan for the roll call is bearing witness requires courage, Mm. not perfection. Mm. That's a big thing for me because Mm -hmm. I, I use my own journey to try to explain to guys, hey, don't wait to get perfect and then come to God. Mm. Come to God and let him work on you Mm -hmm. and he will start weeding out the flaws. The more I wear my Christian faith publicly, the more it locks me into behavior that God would approve of and be pleased with. When I was hiding my Christian faith, my Christian faith was always there, but I kept it covered up so that I could run out into the world and do whatever I wanted to do and have no one judge me as yeah. a Christian. Yeah. And 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 I want to be judged as a Christian because being judged as a Christian makes it so, oh, Jason Whitlock can't go into a strip club mm. because he would look like a fool. Mm. I, Jason Whitlock, he's a, a Christian's in here. Oh my God. He's a, <laughs> I would look like a fool. So I started wearing my faith publicly and it's like there's all kinds of things I can't do and 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 that's actually a good thing I need limit I'm a fallen person we all are we need limits on our behavior and so when I'm reminding myself constantly that I'm a Christian it's like when I get cut off in traffic I don't throw my finger out the window I remember oh I'm a Christian we don't do that and so uh we just want to inspire men to wear their faith. You don't have to be perfect. I'm very flawed. We're all very flawed. We just need courage. And then once you put on that armor of God, watch how much better you'll be. Watch how much happier your wife will be uh, with you, how much happier your children will be with you, how much more effective you'll be on your job, and, and, and how much more willing you will be to stand up against these very toxic forces we have tearing this country down. Mm -hmm. Once you get into the Bible, once you start listening to God's word, you'll understand our constitution and the values that made this country great. You'll understand why America's constitution allowed us to improve and improve and increase Mm -hmm. freedom and rights to so many people that everybody's banging on the door to get into America, all oh, this this horribly racist country, but you got black people and brown people from all over the world that would give anything to live here. This is the safest, most prosperous, most opportunity-rich land in the planet, on the planet, 
for black people. Yeah. That's just a fact. And and it got that way because of our constitutional founding. Mm-hmm. Our constitution was laced with biblical values. And and so we're just going to hammer those points. We're going to have sing some music, have some music there, have some food. Uh, it's going to be a good time. And everybody's going to go home inspired and a better man, a mm-hmm. better husband, a better father, brother, uh, uncle, uh, community leader. We just want to do that. And this will be the first of what we hope will be many that will take around the country the way good. Bill McCartney and the Promise Keepers did. And so soon we'll be coming to Dallas or coming to Atlanta or coming to Los Angeles or awesome. coming to Buffalo. Who knows? Good, good. Well, I'm so excited for that. It's in Nashville this time, April 15th. And tell us what the what what's the website? I don't have it pulled up in front of me. Fearless Army Roll Call dot com. FearlessArmyRollCall.com. Sweet. Sweet. And people can just go to the description of this episode. You can click on it. It'll be right there. If you're anywhere close, driving distance, whatever, um, make it to Nashville or have your husbands make it to Nashville for April 15th. It is going to be awesome. Jason, thank you so much. Everyone subscribe to his YouTube channel, the Fearless Jason Whitlock YouTube channel. Also subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. They're always bringing really good insight. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you, Allie.